Hello and welcome. I'm Amber Lou, and this is the first monthly movie wrap up here in the movie verse. <laughs> Now, October was a big month for movies and saw some of the biggest releases hit the screen, from the dark and twisted Joker origin story from DC Comics through to the second instalment of the Stephen King killer classic, Doctor Sleep. We saw animated yetis, creepy spooky relatives, and sheep with alien friends. We returned to the fairy tale moors in Maleficent Mistress of Evil, busted our butts outsmarting zombies in Zombieland Double Tap, and Arnie did indeed come back for his last rodeo in Terminator Dark Fate. I watched a grand total of eight films in October, Let's talk about them. I'll keep this spoiler free. First up, of course, Joker, directed by Todd Phillips. I had been eagerly awaiting Joker since the trailer dropped last year. Joker is my favourite comic book character of all time, and both Heath Ledger and Mark Hamill have portrayed this character so flawlessly that initially I was a bit reluctant to get excited. When I found out that Joaquin Phoenix had been cast in the role, I just knew he was going to bring this character out of the ashes, and boy, I was not disappointed. Although it has faced a lot of criticism for its dark themes, violence and arguably sympathetic tone towards the villain, I feel the intricacy of every little detail and the request for audience interpretation make it an Oscar-worthy piece of art. Everyone comes out of the cinema with different thoughts, opinions and experiences and that's what I love about it. It has references to Batman the Killing Joke with, if I have to have a past, then I prefer it to be multiple choice, holding substantial relevance. I'll get into that in a different video. There are so many tiny details crammed into two hours, all the sneaky little hints throughout that I just have to discuss. For now though, I gave Joker 5 out of 5 stars for the flawless characterizations, the intimate and intense plunge into madness that has everyone questioning, well, everything, and its handle on nihilism and mental illness that make it timelessly relevant. Next was a bittersweet biopic that plucked at the heartstrings. Judy Garland's desperate life was brought to the big screen by the strong and versatile Renee Zellweger. Judy, directed by Rupert Gould, takes us behind the scenes of her sold-out Talk of the Town tour in London 1968. Going into this having very little knowledge of the performer but wanting to learn more about her and her life, I unfortunately didn't really come away with anything at all. It seemed like this movie was more of a visual representation of the stories you can find online rather than a true exploration or representation. It almost relied on the audience already knowing the facts, meaning details that would have given greater understanding were missed. Zellweger, however, had definitely done her homework and studied Garland's gestures, mannerisms and stage presence to a T. After watching Garland's performances retrospectively, she portrayed even her speech patterns convincingly without directly imitating her. She took a real, well-loved icon and made her her own. There were some deeply moving scenes and her final performance of Over the Rainbow was so hauntingly fragile but beautiful all the same. It's no wonder that everyone expects her to bag an Oscar. I gave this three stars based on the phenomenal level of acting alone. I just wish there was more weight, depth and detail to the story. So after a rather dark start to the month, our night in shining white fur came to our rescue. I was actually pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed and adored Abominable. Directed by Jill Colton and Todd Wilderman, Abominable follows Yi and the two friends on an adventure across China and Nepal to reunite Everest, a stolen yeti, with his family whilst avoiding the grasp of the evil zoologist. First off, the landscapes in this film are truly breathtaking. The art is vibrant and the transition smooth. The positive moral messages such as don't destroy something just because you don't understand it and those in regards to friendship, family and nature as a whole are delivered in a light yet effective way that stick with you long after the movie has ended. This film took you back to your childhood, was heartfelt and full of adventure. A perfect family film. The violin rendition of Cold Place Fix You was just stunning and made up for the questionable research undertaken into Asian lifestyle and the predictable storyline. Also, fun fact, the voice actor of Jin is the grandson of one of the first men to reach the summit of Mount Everest alongside Sir Edmund Hillary in 1953. I honestly really loved this film and gave it four stars. I only knocked a star off because the story was a bit far-fetched and reminiscent of Pokemon, where it's apparently cool for kids to go on dangerous adventures completely unprepared and on their own. Oh, but that giant blueberry slow-mo scene? Priceless. Okay, I have a guilty pleasure and that's Will Smith. When I first saw the poster, I was eager to get a double shot from Ang Lee's Gemini Man. Smith plays Henry Brogan, a retiring assassin who, after being tipped off about conspiracy surrounding his last job, is tracked by an agent who knows his every move. Gemini Man began as a concept back in 1997 but was dropped as computer de-aging technology hadn't advanced enough. As groundbreaking as it is though, this film did not leave a lasting impression. 
Even though the cast lineup and performances were strong, with Will Smith pairing up with Mary Elizabeth Winston and Benedict Wong against Clive Owen's villain, this action thriller lacked the emotional depth I was expecting. Both the script and the plot were thin, and the high frame rate and added effects seemed misplaced and surreal. The pacing felt slow in the first half and rushed in the second. Where I was expecting a deeper connection between Henry and Junior, there wasn't. Where the big reveal should have been more shocking and detailed, it was over quicker than a Thanos snap. I gave just two stars to Gemini Man, which is so disappointing, as it was by no fault of the actors. I just couldn't connect with the story. But I am eager to see where this new technology takes us in the future of cinema. Now we're coming into sequel territory. If you've made it this far, I praise and thank you for your dedication. So, we return to the Moors and Maleficent Mistress of Evil five years after the death of King Stefan. Maleficent is invited to a royal dinner in the wake of Philip's proposal to Aurora, the conniving queen plots to destroy all fairies and starts a war, and a whole army of dark fae descend onto the kingdom of Ulsted in a fiery rage. Joachim Browning delivers high action sequences, sarky humour and raises awareness to the detriments of human arrogance and fear of acceptance. The effervescent and magical landscapes are pure fairy tale, and we have the evil Queen Ingrid, portrayed by Michelle Pfeiffer, taking her crooked throne. I was disappointed by how little we were graced with Jolie's refined expressions and humble ability to own the screen, but for me, this was balanced out by Pfeiffer's faultless delivery, the incredible stunning visuals, and the meandering journey to discover which Maleficent truly is, good or evil. I was quite surprised to give this a solid four stars. One star being dropped for the storyline being rushed in places where there could have been more depth, like the Dark Phoenix legend, and the relationship between Maleficent and other Dark Fae. Moving on to sequel number two, Zombieland Double Tap, directed by Ruben Fleischer. Ten years post Zombieland, Tallahassee, Columbus, Wichita and Little Rock leave their residency in the White House to come face to face with now evolved zombies, meet their doppelgangers, and teach us a heartwarming lesson about family. We are also introduced to new characters Madison and Berkeley, who serve only as plot devices with additional light humour, in their pursuit for a place they can call home. I think we can all say that this was a film for the fans. It was purely nostalgic with a return to slow-mo action sequences and over-the-top violence, the quirky yet charming original cast, and quotes ripped straight from the 2009 hit. We even see the return of Bill Murray in an end credit cameo, and we are treated to references to pop culture throughout. It's really a bunch of light-hearted, senseless fun, and a good laugh. I did enjoy Tallahassee's continued and creative ways of turning a phrase, and the on-screen chemistry between the cast wasn't forced at all. I felt, however, Little Rock was a bit disappointing, and I actually found her quite irritating. Luckily, Zoe Dutch's dumb blonde character took the weight off her shoulders. I gave Zombieland Double Tap 3 out of 5 star rating for its alluring wit, comical action sequences, and for Woody Harrelson's rendition of Burning Love during the closing credits. The Addams Family is next, and I did not like it at all. Directed by Conrad Vernon and Greg Tiernan, the film revolves around Pugsley preparing for his coming-of-age ceremony and Wednesday desperate to experience the outside world. I loved The Addams Family as a kid, their overly flamboyant four-dimensional personalities, the creepy yet inviting aesthetics and endearing family dynamics were entertaining, humorous and original. This animated rendition did not capture the energy or characterizations convincingly, and some parts were really quite dark considering its audience were mainly young children. It relied heavily on references to other films and pop culture and tried too hard to be relatable with all ages of today's society. Some of the jokes were quite out of date, such as Lime in the Coconut and completely won over some heads. The moral messages surrounding family and acceptance felt stagnant and forced due to the rest of the story being so dull. With stellar casting, I had high hopes, but even the quirkiness of the character design and landscaping, almost Burton-esque, lacked flair and resolution. The villain in the form of the TV show host was pretty unique though, but she had more dimensions than the whole family put together. With a run time of just 1 hour and 26 minutes, it felt longer to me than Endgame, and that's why I only gave this two stars. One star just felt too harsh. And finally, I know, it's been a mission, right? The last film I watched in October was Countdown, directed by Justin Deck. This supernatural horror centres around an app that predicts the exact time of your death. This film offered nothing new and was predictable from the get-go. There are a few comical moments with the flat earther, a salesman and a basement priest, but these were way oversaturated. There was a decently unnerving bathroom scene in the hospital, but all other scares were your typical jumps. The situation with the senior doctor could have been handled more tactfully and realistically, and the suspension of disbelief is required throughout. Tampering with evidence, access to restricted areas, and the giving way of credit cards as collateral is a casual thing here. Overall, the main character is very hard to empathise with, No character was explored enough for relatability, and the only redeeming quality was Talitha Bateman, who played the younger sister. 
Seriously, she was phenomenal. The only reason I'm giving this film any stars at all. I award two stars to Miss Bateman alone. So that concludes October's monthly movie wrap up. Thanks for sticking around. Please do let me know what you thought about any of these films down in the comment section. You can also leave your suggestions and requests for movie reviews, discussions and theory explorations down there too. I'll be back soon with Terminator Dark Fate, Doctor Sleep, Shaun the Sheep Farmageddon, The Aeronauts and Midway. I hope to see you there.